Hey, and welcome back to What the Tech is Going On, where we talk about all things tech and business. But before we continue, take a quick second to hit that like and subscribe button because it really helps us out a lot. Coinbase IPO. Are you sick of all the crypto and Bitcoin talk already or are you a believer? The entire crypto universe is celebrating as the well-known and largest cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase made its successful debut on the NASDAQ with an opening price of $381 a share, giving the exchange at one point a valuation that reached $100 billion dollars. This acted yet again as another validation for the hardcore crypto fans. In simplest terms, Coinbase allows users to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrency seamlessly on their platform. Founded in 2021, Coinbase then went through 14 different fundraising rounds and raised around $847.3 million. While this was massively impressive in itself, the successful listing on NASDAQ really showed for the first time the wider market and broad range of investors, general consensus, and widespread acceptance towards this company and cryptocurrency technology as a whole. This was easily the biggest crypto event of the year as it represents how far cryptocurrency has come since its inception from being an unknown and obscure technology only diehards would use to now getting some serious attention and acceptance from investors, companies, and consumers. Aside from the price of Bitcoins rising steadily this year and breaking $50,000 and now hovering at around $60,000, we've seen crypto adoption from large businesses like Microsoft, Tesla, Burger King, Overstock, Whole Foods to Walmart, to name a few. Not just that, payment processing companies like PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa are also jumping on the crypto bandwagon as well. Unsurprisingly, when a company goes public, some people get rich. Coinbase's founder, Brian Armstrong, instantly became one of the richest people in the world, with his 39.6 million shares equating to about $13 billion. Notable investors and venture capitalist firms like Union Square Ventures, Anderson Horowitz, Tim Draper, and even LinkedIn's founder Reid Hoffman got in and cashed out big time with this IPO. While this certainly is huge news and a step closer for cryptocurrency's mission to truly revolutionize the world of finance, we will undoubtedly see many more crypto companies go public in the future. I'm still curious to see what will happen in the future as the greater crypto industry still faces a good amount of uncertainty with regulations and rising competition. Uber is hanging on. The popular yet controversial ride-hailing app Uber is making headlines again. Last year, because of the pandemic, the popular ride-hailing company lost about $6.8 billion as their overall ride bookings dropped about 80%. Fast forward to present day, because the vaccines are rolling out and some states are starting to get more lax in their guidelines and restrictions, Uber is starting to see an uptick in demand as their bookings reach the highest level since last March. But because people are still practicing caution, they're now struggling to recruit enough drivers. Uber plans to try to resolve the situation by throwing as much money as it can as usual and offer more incentives to attract drivers. But it's honestly too early to say what's going to happen and how the company fares throughout the year. While this may sound yet again like another obstacle this controversial company has to overcome, it looks like Uber has another ace up their sleeve to solidify their future. Uber is actually poised to be one of the biggest winners from the upcoming public debut of the Southeast Asian ride hailing company called Grab that is set to go public via the world's largest SPAC merger that is valued at $40 billion. Turns out Uber is Grab's largest shareholder, and with a valuation of over $40 billion, Uber's stake could be upward of $5 billion. So how does Uber end up having a stake at a competing Asian ride-hailing app? Great question. Several years ago, if you remember, when Uber's founder Travis Kalanick was at its helm, the company set out to dominate new global markets by doing what it knows best, spending billions of dollars to try to beat its competitors like Didi in China and Grab in Southeast Asia. As a matter of fact, Uber nearly spent about $1 billion fighting grab alone and according to Travis in 2016 the company was also losing a billion a year in China at the time. When Uber's leadership finally realized that spending billions of dollars was proving to be too expensive they decided to sell their local operations to the competitors in return for a sizable equity stake in return. Rather than just calling it quits and pulling out at least Uber set up a situation for themselves with an upside rather than leave the battlefield empty-handed. And paid off it did. Grab did about 1.6 billion in net revenue in 2020 and their SPAC merger sponsored by Altimeter Capital Management ended up being the record valuation for all SPACs. 
apps. With their 60% equity in Grab, Uber is sitting pretty. Aside from Grab, Uber also has Siri stakes in Chinese ride-hailing giant Didi and in the Indian food delivery service Zomato. In total, Uber's positions in these companies could be worth around $18 billion. With Didi planning on going public and Zomato possibly going public later this year, with their relative 12 and 10% stake in both companies, Uber is looking at a nice payday. While it's not 100% sure how long Uber will hold their position and for what purpose they will use this extra cash for, I bet they aren't complaining. With a battled history of leadership changes, news about their toxic culture and struggling ventures in both the trucking and self-driving car industries, Uber needs more cash than ever to support their core businesses. While this is also a far cry from being hailed as a dominant tech company that is innovating and acting as a primary driver in global markets, at least for now, Uber might have a second chance for glory by gambling and betting on competitors. Amazon again. Ever since the pandemic last year, technology companies and the technology industry as a whole adapted and embraced remote life pretty quickly. Companies like Google and Facebook acted as the forefront of the change and went a step further when they declared that the workforce can remain remote indefinitely. While many applauded the decision and got excited that remote work would be here for good and that working from home office in shorts and sweats could remain as a reality forever, employees at Amazon got a rude awakening. On March 30th, Amazon notified its employees that the company will go back to a full office-centric culture, and many employees, as you can imagine, got pissed. Workers were frustrated that Amazon wasn't showing or offering more flexibility like other companies like Facebook, Google, and Microsoft after a year when the workforce proved that they could work productively and successfully at home. Not only will it be a logistical and timing nightmare forcing all of the employees to go back into the office, but also how will they be able to do it safely and making sure strict guidelines and vaccination timelines are followed and upheld? What about employees who move to a different state? or a country, or bought a house elsewhere assuming at the time they would be able to remain remote forever, or at least a long period of time. Many people also believe that this effort to rigidly snap back into the office will not only hurt Amazon's morale and internal culture, but will also impact recruiting and talent retainment initiatives, with many other companies like Spotify, Slack, Skillshare, Twitter, and others continuing to allow their employees to work remotely, how will Amazon and others be able to compete for new talent who embrace remote work and flexible policies, but also make sure there is no company-wide exodus of talent internally going to other companies. I mean, if I had a chance to move somewhere else, where I could have a better way of life, or live somewhere that is so much bigger than my shoebox of an apartment in San Francisco or New York, while working productively in comfortable clothes like sweats and shorts, <clears throat> and then I was told I had to leave everything again and move back to the city, live somewhere smaller, and commute back into the office every single day, I would run for the hills. It's tough enough to hire really technical roles like software engineers as is, and I suspect this will raise the challenge substantially in the future. While it's not clear how much of Amazon's 1 million plus workforce shares the same consensus, forums, for example, like on Blyde.com, an anonymous professional network indicates rising discontent and anger among Amazon employees, and others believed that this decision is really the start of Amazon regressing as a leader. An Amazon spokesperson remains firm that the employees working in the office will be its baseline and that 10% of its corporate employees work from the office already and expects more to start working back this summer with expectations that most will return by the fall and the whole process will be staggered and gradual. While there are murmurs that you might have more flexibility depending on what team you're on and the company could make exceptions for a few, you can't deny that after a whole year there are now tons of studies, data, and testimonials that work from home and remote work can boost productivity and have serious positive effects on people's lives on a number of fronts. So there is no question that there will be a good number of people People and talent leaving regardless or seriously thinking about doing so. For a company that has been in the news a lot and not for the right reasons, such as using shitty tactics to prevent a union from forming, having toxic and extremely cutthroat environment, to their lack of transparency communicating how many COVID cases they have and their weak or lack thereof safety measures that follow, to even having many of their top executives hypocritically having the ability to work remotely over the past and several couple of years and now completely dropping the ball and how this going back to the office decision was communicated, Amazon will really have to step up their game and navigate these waters carefully. As many companies will inevitably go back into the office, it will be interesting to see what Amazon and other tech companies do and how they handle the situation. While many look at tech companies as the leaders who adopt change and do things differently, it seems like in this example, rather than leading, this tech giant seems to be regressing. 
Kardashian billionaire. Do we really need to talk about the Kardashians? Well, the family not only has one, but two billionaires now. Kim Kardashian is now officially a billionaire as well, according to Forbes. It is estimated that she is worth $1 billion, up from $780 million in October, mainly from two of her businesses that are killing it, KKW Beauty and Skims. But she also generates a sizable income flow from reality TV shows, endorsement deals, and her other investments. Following her sister's Kylie massive success with her own cosmetics line, Kylie's Cosmetics, that had catapulted her to billionaire status, Kim launched KKW Beauty in 2017 with 300,000 makeup contouring kits that sold out within two hours. By 2018, she expanded into other verticals such as concealers, eyeshadows, lipsticks that brought in about $100 million in revenue. She later sold 20% of this business to cosmetics giant Cody that also previously bought 51% of Kylie's company for $200 million that valued KKW Beauty at $1 billion, making Kim's remaining 7% valued at about $500 million or more. She then launched Skims in 2019, focusing on shapewear, and then with more people lounging at home during quarantine, the company expanded the product verticals to also include loungewear. While exact revenues isn't disclosed, Forbes estimated that her stake in Skims could be worth more than $225 million. While it's easy to make fun of celebrities in general, especially those that rose to fame through reality TV show, and while we don't know if these brands and businesses will stick around for a long haul, we can at least for now tip our hats and give credit where credit is due as the Kardashians continue to strategically leverage their massive fan base and followers on social media to launch successful businesses and brands. Thanks again for joining me on what the tech is going on and to make sure you continue to stay updated with these videos, please don't forget to like and subscribe as it really, really, really helps us a lot. I also try to post daily on Instagram and TikTok at Preston underscore park, so follow me as well if you want. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next one.